Welcome to the Scientific Sense podcast, where we explore emerging ideas from science, policy, economics, and technology. My name is Gil Epen. We talk with world's leading academics and experts about their recent research or general areas of topical interest. Scientific Sense is an unstructured conversation with no agenda or preparation. We cover a wide variety of domains where new discoveries are made and new technologies are developed on a daily basis. We are most interested in how new ideas affect society and help educate the world how to pursue a rewarding and enjoyable life rooted in science, logic, and information. We seek knowledge without boundaries or constraints and provide unedited content of conversations with researchers and leaders who love what they do. A companion blog to this podcast can be found at scientificsense.com and this podcast is available on over a dozen platforms and directly at scientificsense.net. If you have suggestions for topics, guests, and other ideas, please send them to info at scientificsense.com and I can be reached at gill at epen.info. My guest today is Professor Gregory Lachlan, who is a professor of astronomy and astrophysics at Yale University. He is interested in hydrodynamic simulations, the characterization of extrasolar planets, and planet forming environments, as well as the future of the universe. He has done research on a variety of topics, including star formation, extrasolar planets, interstellar objects, and with Fred Adams, he's the author of The Five Ages of the Universe. Welcome, Greg. Oh, thank you, Gil. Sure. Yeah, so uh, you have an um, unpublished paper <laughs> that I found very, very <laughs> interesting. And uh, it's entitled On the Energetics of Large-Scale Computation Using Astronomical Resources. Uh, you say global energy expenditures for artificial computation continue to increase at the current rate, which is almost exponential now. The required power consumption will exceed the power consumption of the biosphere in less than a century. So if this conclusion holds, you say, uh, you say this conclusion holds even with the assumption that all artificial computation proceeds uh, with optimal thermodynamic efficiency. So even if we get the, the optimum efficiency, you are basically arguing that we are going to run out of power <laughs> to, to compute. Um, so, yeah. so, yeah, so could, could you describe, you know, the sort of the, uh, the, the numbers that you're using to, to reach this conclusion? Sure. The, um, you know, what, what kind of got me interested in this problem of large scale computation, there was an article in the New York Times few years ago about how uh, data centers were moving to Iceland. And the reason why they were moving to Iceland is because the hydroelectric power there is uh, pretty inexpensive. And then also because the cooling yep. of, of servers is very efficient in, and, in, in Iceland. Yeah, and Amazon and, has a big uh, facility in Sweden too. So most of Northern Scandinavia <laughs> is now- Yeah, yeah. Iceland, and then, yeah. Yeah, and Google has set up servers, um, for instance, in Hood River, Oregon, to take advantage of the Columbia River. Mm. And and so, what what is kind of going on is is that um, the use of power to do computation, that is to run servers as well as to run all of our devices, now uses about two percent of um, the electricity that's produced on Earth. And it's equivalent to taking um, all of the sunlight that falls all year round on a patch of earth that's about 100 kilometers um, square. Mm. And so something like one ten millionth of the energy that's striking the earth and the sun, the equivalent of that, is being used uh, to do computation here on earth. Mm. And that's a number that is growing um, exponentially. Uh, and then another thing that, you know, kind of got me, really got my attention was, was this idea of, of using proof of work 
as a way of um, running cryptocurrencies. Hmm. And proof of work, you know, which is what is underlying um, Bitcoin, is this really interesting way of equating energy, uh, money, and um, bit operations and sort of showing that those three concepts are all fungible into one another. They're all equivalent at some level. And so energy is computation. Yep. Yeah. So, so Bitcoin, um, essentially, it's a process. We won't get into the details of it. Uh, Bitcoin mining, I think it's called sometimes, that requires a fair amount of computing, uh, computing power uh, to, to do that. So, so what you're saying is that um, really, if you, if you are successful in mining that Bitcoin, you get some value. So that is the, that's sort of the revenue. Uh, but there's a cost associated with it, which is obviously the computing resources as well as the electricity or the power that goes into it. And so, um, and so the differential is what, what a Bitcoin miner actually makes, right? Yeah, so, so a, a Bitcoin miner, what Bitcoin miner is effectively doing is computing something called an SHA-256 hash. Yeah. And that is a bunch of arithmetic operations. And in fact, there's kind of a, a nice illustration I saw on a website where somebody did an SHA-256 hash by hand. Uh, they, you know, there was a lot of addition and multiplication. And, you know, it took, I think it took about a day and a half and they had to check their work very carefully. And yeah. um, the, the idea is to, to do these hashes as quickly as possible. And the, the result of the hash is the string of numbers. Mm. And what you're hoping for is that once you compute the hash, you'll compute a string of numbers that starts with a large number of zeros. Once you've delivered the answer to a hash, it's very easy to check. And so you have to do a lot of work to find it. But then once you've found it, it's very everybody can easily agree that you've found the answer. And so the, the more of these hashes that you can do per second, uh, the better your chances are of finding that that golden ticket. And if you find that golden ticket, that hash that starts with a large number of zeros, then you get um, your rewarded Bitcoins for what's known as mining that block and you're added to the chain. And then that chain becomes part of the consensus chain. Mm. And so you win if you can as fast Possible, but then you also need to spend power at a rate that's less than the rate that you're mining bitcoins, so that that you uh, come out ahead financially. It doesn't make sense if you're spending more on your electricity bill than you're getting back in bitcoin. Um, and so that has led to this extraordinary almost arms race in um, designing faster and faster processors to do this very specialized task. And in particular, not just to do them fast, which is sort of the idea of much of super computation that goes on, but also to do them as efficiently from an energy standpoint as possible. And it mm. points toward this very interesting idea that was um, first pointed out in the 1960s by a scientist at, at, at IBM called the Landauer. What the Landauer limit tells you is that at a particular temperature, there's a minimum cost, a minimum energy cost for flip-up bit that is turning a zero into a one. You could do that by mm. writing a zero on a piece of paper and a one on the other side and turning the paper over. And doing that would cost about 10 ergs of energy. You could also mm. imagine a zero in your mind and then turn that one into mine. And the metabolic cost of doing that would be measurable as well in terms of ergs. It would be much less than physically turning a piece of paper over, but it would nonetheless be um, very finite. And what the Landauer limit is saying is that there's a well-defined thermodynamic minimum energy at a particular temperature that you can, you can do that. And so what that means is that computation can't become infinitely efficient. There's a lower floor. Right. It's very interesting because even if we make our computation as hit that limit and we're about a factor of 10 million or things like a Bitcoin miner, even if we, we, we get to that limit, we're still increasing the amount of computation that we're doing fast enough so that um, 
the macroscopic use of energy on Earth is going to be going to be an issue. Um, you know, yeah. Bitcoin was sort of like the idea du jour a few years ago, and I think the exciting, really task are these uh, language learning models for Great. artificial intelligence like GPT-3. So, so that makes intuitive sense that there, there has to be a minimum limit to flip a bit, whether it's a biological system, whether it's a physical action or whether it's electronic. And so, so that minimum limit uh, could be computed uh, based on some proxies, I would imagine, right? And so what, what you're saying then is if the computational requirements are sort of increasing exponentially, it, it cannot go up infinitely because the, the energy budget is limited. Um, yeah. is, and, is that the basic yeah. concept? Yeah. yeah, that's the basic concept. And, and you know, something that, that kind of flows naturally from that idea is that um, DNA replication that's going on continuously in huge number of cells throughout the entire biosphere of the earth is effectively uh, a computation. So it's the equivalent of writing ones and zeros to a disk drive when you, when you um, replicate DNA, you're, you're copying data and DNA uses a four letter alphabet rather than ones and zeros, but information theory wise, it's exactly the same thing. And you know, when you when you look at a planet like Mars, where there's not a lot of biological computation going on, Mars is pretty reflective. The the light that hits the surface of Mars is is, is bouncing off, and Mars's albedo, its brightness, is large. And Earth's albedo, if there were no life on it, would be large as well. So, on areas of Earth where there's very little. Um, going on, for instance, the, the desolate parts of the Sahara Desert or the Atacama Desert or the empty quarter of Arabia or Antarctica, you have a yeah. high re reflectivity. But um, in areas where the, the, the density of biological computation is very high, for instance, in the Amazon Basin or the Congo Basin, um, all the greenery, all the the, the, the plants are absorbing the sunlight and effectively they're using that sunlight to do computation. And if you study the molecular dynamics of those DNA replications, you see that the, the biology has actually figured out a way to do that computation very efficiently. Biology is probably somewhere between a factor of 10 and 100 times um, higher than that absolute minimum bound, which is much better than present day computers, although present day computers are getting better and better uh, very, very rapidly. And so we'll approach that biological limit, you know, likely within our lifetimes. Uh, but nonetheless, the earth is using a substantial fraction of the amount of light that hits it to effectively do computation. And so for the last four and a half billion years, or at least the last say three billion years, Earth has been, you know, acting as a computer to do an enormous number of bit operations, and the the result of those calculations are all the diversity that we see in life. So we, uh, life has discovered all sorts of amazing molecules, all sorts of interesting ways of, of of doing things, and that's a result of a lot of computation. And so it's just interesting to see, you know, if you think of things in terms of of that way, a computer is not just something sitting on your desk, but rather computation is really the the the, the way by which the universe manages to do interesting things. Right. And so, so if I understand this correctly, Greg, so uh, the, the current budget uh, in terms of power usage by artificial computation, you said we are using about 10 to the power of minus six of the, of the solar incidents. About 10 to the minus seven. So oh, 10, to, 10, to, 10, 10 to, okay. Okay, and and the bio and plants are you said ten uh, x more efficient. Oh, plants uh, so are actually the, much. Sorry, plants are much more efficient. Plants are probably probably of order um, be, at least a thousand, and probably more like a, several hundred thousand times more efficient per bit operation than our okay. fast our best computers. And then they're right, using right. you know something like 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 
uh, 20%, 10 to 20% of the solar energy is, is striking, striking plants and being absorbed. So right now the amount that the amount of artificial computation is the artificial computation is growing at an extremely rapid rate and the biological computation has been fixed for the last you know, 100 million years, 300 million years at least. Okay. And so, so regardless of, you know, so, so there, are, there is some space for artificial computation to get uh, more efficient, uh, but we are talking mm-hmm. about a couple of orders of magnitude. Um, yeah. uh, presumably, we can we can use more of the energy coming to us from the sun. That is a few orders of magnitude. But ultimately, what you're saying, yeah. So even if you are sitting at a at a capacity of let's say ten to the power ten, for argument's sake, sure. uh, at some point we go, we're going to run out of that as well, right? Yeah. Yeah. So if you have a doubling time of three years, then you run through. 10 to the 10 in, you know, roughly a couple decades, three, 30 years or so. And so, you know, I guess I, I'm not, I don't want to come across as some sort of wild eyed Ray Kurzweil <laughs> singularity is near type, but what I think I'm more sort of the, 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 the takeaway here is that economic growth and computation are increasingly becoming one and the same thing. So productivity gains in the last you know, half century have been driven by gains in our ability to do computation. And I see no reason why that won't continue to be the case. The language models mm-hmm. are, are getting to be excellent. GPT-3 is excellent at doing writing tasks and the, the improvement is extremely rapid. And so the sort of economic activity that's going to be generated by language models is, is going to be a game changer. And that's going to happen not in our lifetimes, but rather in just a few years. Um, and so the, right. you know, the idea that economic growth continues is three, 2%, you know, sort of like this year on year increase in the GDP that depends on a year on year increase in, in computation and you can make computation more efficient, but there's a, a floor to where you can get with that. And so what that means is that economic growth cannot continue for more than a century without using all the energy that we get from the sun. And so it's right. just pointing towards, it's pointing towards the fact that, 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 things over the next hundred years are going to be different. The, the way that the economy grows, the whole science of economics is going to be different in the coming century than it has been in the last few centuries. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I'm just thinking about it, Greg. So if, if uh, humans were not here, um, it would have been sort of a stable system in the sense that um, you know, if the energy input is not there, um, uh, per- perhaps, you know, they get different types of plant, plants, some plants die off. And so, so the system would have been still, I would imagine, still stable. Um, but when we introduce humans to it, um, well, one could argue, um, even with humans in it, what we may find is that the system is going to stabilize at a different level. For instance, there are some hypotheses around the population growth uh, that is going to hit the maximum around 2040, and by uh, by 2100, uh, they say population is going to going to be on a on a rapid declining path uh, for the world. So some of these assumptions are based on uh, what we believe the current rates are, right, in terms of growth. Yeah, I mean the the. I don't. I don't want to come across as some weird weirdo rationalist uh, kind of Mensa type <laughs> figure, but human human um, thought or, or human activity that the, the activity in the brain is is computation, and while yeah. it's not fully clear what the um, energy. Uh, per bit operation in the brain is. That's an imperfect analogy. And nonetheless, the brain is doing computation. And when you when you look at things like, for instance, um, when AlphaGo beat Lee Seedle in, in a big showdown a few years ago, um, 
Hmm. Lee Seedall was sort of running at an energy rate of, you know, 100 calories per hour. Um, right. Four, four times 10 to the six joules or, or um, of order five times 10 to the 13 ergs per hour. And the, the tensor processing units that were up against him um, in the mental activity of playing the, the, the go game were, were running at a substantially higher rate. So Lee Seidel was more efficient um, during the time that the matches were being played. But interestingly, if you account for all the energy that Lee Seidel spent in learning Go over a lifetime, mm -hmm. um, the energy cost that he spent learning Go was probably comparable to the energy cost that the computer spent learning Go. And so right now there mm -hmm. are, uh, you know, I can't remember what the number is, <laughs> some seven, <laughs> eight, nine billion people on earth. And so the computation that's being done by humans um, still vastly outstrips that done by computers. But by 2040, that will likely be reversed if things continue. And so the idea mm. of population growth uh, is going to be subsumed into the idea of computation growth within a few decades. And I think that that's an idea that hasn't really seeped into the overall sort of thinking of, of, of humanity. Um, the, the energy cost yeah. that we're going to do is going to be outstripped by the out energy cost of computers if computers continue to grow at their current rate. Right, right. Yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's tough to speculate, but, uh, you know, it's also possible that the, the humans who remain in 2100 uh, could be different types of humans. And so, if you know, if all the computing or, or a lion's share of computing has now shifted to to computers, uh, humans then are perhaps using less power to maybe humans don't have to think anymore. <laughs> you know, you can delegate thinking um, uh, to the machines. And so, the problem that you are citing still remains, which is if you have a higher higher energy or higher computing demanding human on earth in 2100, even though the numbers are declining marginally, it shouldn't really eat into this exponential requirement we still yeah. have in terms of energy. Yeah, right? yeah. I mean, if, if, if economic growth continues at a few percent per year, and even if computing becomes, you know, as efficient as it can be, it will, it, you're, you're going to run into, uh, you know, a serious bottleneck of using the entire solar energy resource within a century. Right. And so, so what can we do about this, Greg? Well, I don't really think of it as what can we do? I, I, <laughs> I, I'm, um, I think that that's kind of an arrogant, like, like standpoint to, um, you know, yeah. try to say like how we're going to direct the, what the sun's energy production is. So I, I, I don't want to give the listeners the, the, the sense that, that I'm trying to direct policy, but rather think, you know, has this gone on elsewhere, right? Or, or it doesn't seem that there's any other intelligent civilizations in the galaxy, doesn't, there's no evidence for that. There's no evidence right. actually anywhere that there are intelligent civilizations, but if there were, and they experienced this computational bottleneck, is there a way to radically increase your energy use for, for computation? Are there mm -hmm. venues where you can do a lot more computation. And by computation, I, I, I'm not really thinking about quantum computation or the possibility of reversible computation, but rather mm. the kind of computation that we do that uses devices, um, like graphene, for instance, a silicon. And, and so, you know, the, the question is, is like where, where in the galaxy are the best venues for doing computation and to do computation you first and foremost you need energy um, you need a thermodynamic gradient and you need a source of raw material and in thinking about this we we sort of realize that, that dying stars actually dying stars like the sun that have come to the end of their lives and are spewing enormous amounts of carbon um, into space provide <laughs> sort of curiously ideal 
uh, venues for doing computation. You can run um, effectively a, a if you if you kind of catalyze what's happening in one of these winds coming off of a red giant star, you can catalyze the construction of nanoscale devices to do computation. And then they do computation for a period of years as they flow outwards through the, the wind. And eventually they, they reach a region where that, that energy has been absorbed and you know, mm -hmm. you sort of ejects this stuff into the interstellar medium. Um, and so, so it's, it's, go ahead. Yeah. No, no. So, so let me just uh, uh, understand this. So um, a, a star like the sun um, in, in a few billion years, uh, in the process of dying, would become, would become a red giant. Yeah. And yeah. Um, so, so the, the phase that you're talking about is post the re red giant phase or the, uh, yeah. So the red giant phase? Yeah, yeah. So the details of what the sun will do are, are, are pretty interesting. And that's because it has access to, um, once it gets hot enough in its center, right now helium um, is being formed in the core of the sun. And the sun is running through its hydrogen fuel. It's roughly half done with its it's burning the hydrogen fuel that it can access and then that helium the sun is nowhere near hot enough in its center right now to fuse into carbon but after the sun becomes a red giant for the first time um it will have problems in its core it will ignite helium start burning helium into carbon and it'll become um it'll red giant phase becomes sort of like a just a regular luminous star it's about 50 times the luminosity of the current sun mm. but then it will run out of helium as it turns its helium into carbon mm. and then when it runs out of starts running out of helium it will turn into a red giant for a second time and that second time is really the clincher because the carbon it will never get hot enough in the core of the sun to fuse carbon into heavier elements that requires temperature, something like a billion degrees, and the sun will not be able to obtain those temperatures. And so the sun's sort of final last gasp, second stage asymptotic giant branch phases will consist of this epoch when the, the atmosphere of the sun is effectively being blown off by a wind and a carbon oxygen white dwarf mm. is forming as, as an extremely dense hot object in the center. And during this period, which lasts for order 10,000 years, um, the sun is, will be roughly 4,000, 5,000 times more luminous than it is now. We're putting out an enormous amount of energy mm. per second. Um, and then it's also in placing enormous quantities of carbon um, newly created carbon into its atmosphere and so from mm. far it will look like this giant room temperature black cloud that's you know tens of times larger than the current solar system it's sort of a pretty pretty crazy crazy wow. <laughs> object and there's yeah. there's a few thousand of these in our galaxy right now these are stars yeah. that are you know really finishing up their lives and uh in a million years or so, they'll be visible as, as white dwarfs and uh, their atmospheres will have dispersed into the interstellar medium to help seed the next generation of stars. The material that formed our own solar system incorporates material that was, was spewed out of red giant stars that were dying four and a half billion years ago. Okay, Let, let's, um, we'll take a quick break, uh, Greg. When we, when sure. we come back, uh, we'll talk about how we could potentially, at least from a thought experiment perspective, <laughs> think about using that as a computational vehicle. Sure. Thank you. This is a Scientific Sense podcast providing unscripted conversations with leading academics and researchers on a variety of topics. If you'd like to sponsor this podcast, please reach out to info at scientificsense.com. So we are back, uh, Greg. So we've been talking about um, the energy requirements for computing 
And with everything that we see today, um, the, the computing requirements are increasing sort of exponentially. Uh, and even if we increase efficiency of use over time, uh, there is still uh, sort of an upper bound <clears throat> of how many bits or how many computing units uh, we could extract uh, based on the energy coming to coming to the earth from the sun. And so you uh, hypothesize that, um, you know, just very, very approximately uh, uh, in about 100 years or so, uh, we may hit that upper upper limit which would then mean that if you want to continue increasing uh, computational power, you have to look outside the outside the earth um, uh, at that point. And so uh, there may be civilizations out there, we haven't found any, uh, who might have hit this upper limit and would have figured something out. So you have a thought experiment here, which is uh, using, using uh, a star that is sort of in the dying phase. Uh, so it has gone through uh, the red giant phase uh, and it is now oozing out carbon the way that I understand it, uh, uh, Greg. And, uh, and so you want to talk a little bit about uh, what, what you're thinking there? Sure, yeah. I mean, I, I think it's also important just to stress that I don't really think that any, any of this is happening. It's more, <laughs> I think, that, 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 that the rate at which things are exponentiating here on Earth uh, can't continue or very, very likely won't continue. And so yes. the, the sort of continuation that I'm discussing is very much in the vein of, as you said, a, a thought experiment rather than some wild-eyed prediction. I would put no money <laughs> um, what I'm talking about happening yeah. or or happening in the future, but it's something that, that the laws of physics and our current sort of inventory of astronomical objects would allow. And so it's interesting for kind of podcast style discussion, right. which is why I sent this particular unpublished paper to you to sort of spur a discussion like the one we're having. Yeah, yeah. Um, and but, so... Yeah, the goal here is to use the star in some way, right? Yeah, yeah. So, so these dying red giant stars, just um, from an astrophysical standpoint, just provide this perfect opportunity for computation because yeah. um, they they uh, are opaque to visible light, but they are um, transparent to, for instance, to microwaves. And so if you had small graphene devices that are communicating um, by microwaves, then you could communicate and coordinate computation in this huge atmosphere of the star, which, and these are really, really large objects um, during the phase that we're sort of envisioning. Um, it's not a star as such, but rather it's a, a white dwarf, a very hot white dwarf in the center. And then there's this wind that's coming off the white dwarf, this dusty wind full of carbon nanotubes and buckyballs and things like that, um, which is, is hydrodynamically blowing away from the star. And so you have a strong temperature gradient. So the waste heat from the computation that's being done in the inner layer can be harnessed to do computation in the cooler layer out. And so you can kind of cascade down through and use your waste heat to do another round of computation until finally you're emitting waste heat at a very low temperature. Yeah. And there's more than enough stuff to continuously catalyze the construction of devices. So this isn't, don't want to think of it, you know, building MacBook Pros <laughs> in the cloud, but rather yeah. building a sort of a fog almost of small nanoscale devices that would be harnessed to do very, very simple computations in a, in a very massively parallel way. Mm -hmm. Now, I haven't designed the actual you know, sort of logic diagrams for this. <laughs> so that part is admittedly vague, but it is true that graphene um, has remarkable um, properties for building small logic gates. And so it really is something that while it's not something that we're doing, it's something that we easily easily could be done. Right. And then what's kind of interesting is, is that 
it's not a computer that just sits there, but it's a dynamic object that takes advantage of this evolutionary stage. Mm. And when the graphene stuff has been done its computation and it's passed through all of these layers of the wind, it's just ejected into interstellar space. Right. Yeah, so there's a thought experiment uh, here, uh, Greg, <clears throat> if I understand this correctly. Uh, in advanced civilization, a uh, hundred years would be, I think, too too short a window for us to do this. I would imagine, but a, a really advanced civilization uh, could utilize the raw materials that exist around the sun and create what you call a computing layer uh, around that uh, white dwarf um, uh, at that point, and the white dwarf is providing it energy. Uh, and the computing layer can essentially take that energy from the inner layers and progressively move it toward the outer layers, and in the process can accomplish computing. Is that is that the idea? Yeah, yeah, and that's all that's all happening naturally. Yeah. So the the transfer of energy is something that's that's happening naturally and is well understood. And so it's simply a matter of catalyzing that energy to do computation mm -hmm. by organizing small devices. And then I guess the one the one thing that I think is kind of interesting to point out is that I wouldn't think of it as a civilization that's harnessing a star to do this. Mm. The star is the civilization. Mm. So the the amount of computation that's being done here is is truly, truly vast. It's uh equivalent to all the computation being done on billions of planets. Mm it way, way outstrips anything that we can imagine a, a planet-based civilization doing. And so the idea that, that um, you know, sort of some planet-based civilization or we as humans would be in charge of this is, 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 is ludicrous. <laughs> okay. It's, the civilization is the star. Okay. So, um, and so... <laughs> if there is some sort of an entity uh, that is that is doing it, that entity will be uh, on that layer. They they'll be living there. No, no the, the yeah. I, I guess I guess the the think of it if you think of the inside of your mind, yeah. right? Yeah. The the computational substrate is a bunch of neurons that uh -huh. are are. Um, firing through a combination of electrical and chemical actions. Right. And you as an individual, your thoughts, your consciousness is, is, is a manifestation or is an emergent phenomenon mm -hmm. that, that occurs because that's happening in a microscopic way. And so in some similar way, the cloud would be doing calculations mm -hmm. and it would be thinking, it would be sentient, it might be composed of a large number of individual conscious units. I have no idea, nor mm. do, you know, I have that much interest in speculating, but it, the important thing to understand is that it's, it's ability to think, it's ability to manipulate information vastly, vastly exceeds anything that we could do, no matter how large our population grows on earth and no matter how efficient our computation becomes mm. on or if this is something that's billions of times further removed and represents sort of our universe's best opportunity for doing really, really large scale thinking about whatever. Mm. So it is sort of akin to a brain, really, at that point. Yeah, uh, it's, it's, it's a akin to, yeah, it's akin to a, 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 a giant brain. Now, again, I have no idea what it would want or why it would be thinking what it thinks. I <laughs> have no presumption. The only, the only thing that I know is that if it were to exist, it would be an extraordinarily um, powerful information processing mm -hmm. entity. There was a story yeah. by uh, Fred Hoyle, a wonderful science fiction book that probably many of your readers have, have read, titled The Black Cloud. And he effectively describes a low energy version of exactly this. Um, his, in the, the only difference between Fred Hoyle's black cloud and the entity that I'm envisioning is simply that, that, that a red giant 
dying red giant has a lot more energy for computation. Mm -hmm. But the black cloud is really, that's the model. And I think that was really, really insightful, extraordinarily insightful idea that he had for, 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 for that time. An amazing, amazing story. Mm -hmm. So this, this should be sort of an evolutionary uh, next step in the sense that civilizations like ours will ultimately run out of energy, may vanish for other reasons. Uh, but over time, uh, what, we f may, what, we may, what we may find in the universe are advanced entities such as this. So could, could we consider this potentially sort of a next evolutionary step? Well, it might not be next in the sense that, that it may have been going on for, for a long time. Once, once it starts, it likely would be able to figure out how to seed the process in other dying red giant stars. Um, that could be done remotely, or it could be done by sending small, small um, von Neumann-like machines through, through, through the galaxy. It would not be that difficult if you knew how to seed this process to get this going. Because once it gets going, the energy and the raw materials are there. It's simply a matter of, of organization to, to, to cause this to happen. And it started happening a long time ago. In fact, it may even have been happening in the red giants that spewed out the material that gave rise to the solar system. And this is really getting into the far out regime and another reason why it wasn't too easy to ride even doing it. But if this is going on, then these small nano devices might be present in the primitive meteorites that we have here on Earth. Uh, when we look out, um, do we see uh, things like that? I think you mentioned uh, could be the thousands of these out there. Do, do we have any evidence of these types of things? Yeah. So, so, so there was a satellite that NASA, by evidence of these things, what I mean is evidence for objects in which this could be done, objects that are thousands of times more luminous than the sun and effectively room temperature. They're so large and cool that even though they're emitting a large amount of energy, they're, they're, they're coming from kind of like room temperature clouds that are you know, tens of times larger than the solar system. And NASA has or had a spacecraft called the WISE. That was a wide field infrared um, survey spacecraft. And um, it took pictures of the entire sky in a number of infrared bands. And so you can then ask for, from the pictures, you can say, if there were room temperature objects with thousands of solar luminosities, please, please find such objects in the data. And what you see is that there's hundreds of them in the disk of the Milky Way and a number of them in the large Magellan clouds. And that was expected because we know that this is how, this is the phase that stars, brief phase that stars go through sunlight stars go through when they die. And so it's, it was kind of interesting. You know, I, I, I did that with the data and sort of saw them all staring at me. And, and, you know, for a moment was thinking, man, you know, some of these might, might be more than just dying stars. They might really be doing something interesting. But again, mm -hmm. um, I, it, it just, I, I, I get kind of tired of like far out speculations of stars <laughs> publishing those trying to get, yeah. get in the paper and saying that this or that thing coming through is an alien spaceship or it's just, it's, it's, it's gotten to be a little bit of a problem. And so, you know, I thought I don't have to, I don't have to publish every idea that, <laughs> that I have. No, thought experiments are always, always good. But in the, in the conclusions here, uh, <laughs> you also point out something which is much more, uh, much more practical. Um, you say, uh, so if you buy this idea that we're going to run out of energy, which, which seems very intuitive, if you think about it, uh, you say one alternative um, involves uh, transition to another economic model. We cannot sustain the economic model that we currently have. Uh, so yeah. that the comput computational demand need, to grow, need not grow exponentially in order to support the economy. And the other option is for the economy as a whole to cease its exponential growth. Now, 100 years is a very, very short period of time. And, and so 
these are actually very relevant policy questions we have to yeah we have to start thinking about right no absolutely right and it's a little bit like the idea of of not publishing this fantastic I mean, not by fantastic is not great but fantastic and in, in the sense of probably fantastical paper is a little bit in line with you know the, the, the constant go 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 economic growth has got to be three percent right thinking about how to transition to a system where we're in equilibrium with the earth i think is a much more valid and valuable thought experiment to do rather than the wild eyed let's fire up a red giant star and do a billion times you know a billion x multiple um i think that 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 realistically if we're going to make it as a species we're not going to make it by colonizing the universe but we're going to make it by somehow figuring out how to bring things into equilibrium mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and another another insight here is you know you say you know the singularity in artificial intelligence uh, very hyped up area a lot of people talked about it and talking about it still uh the the singularity that they talk about uh c- could also be limited by this idea this issue which is the energy budget is limited um there is no question about it so if uh if singularity is going to happen by exponentially moving up the technology curve and at some point we hit the singularity that may not happen because uh because of the energy constraints potentially so my my the calculations are the best guess calculations that you can do indicate that the singularity would happen before the energy bottleneck is reached so the main uncertainty in that is exactly how much computation is the human brain doing and the 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 estimates on effectively the, the computational throughput of the human brain like what's required to to create create the consciousness that we have um the number of bit operations per second that are required to do that using a, a von neumann style computer those those estimates vary by literally a few orders of magnitude but um the best guess is that 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 sort of advanced general artificial intelligence is going to be online by say 2040 2045 and the continuing our current exponential growth of computation and continuing our current increases in the efficiency of computation doesn't seem like we're going to be running into an energy bottleneck at the point where we run into an artificial intelligence singularity so it's like we're going to hand over we're going to hand over insight and control before nature puts a lid on us in terms of the energy bottleneck <laughs> and that's interesting right. yeah yeah i am sort of less optimistic about this craig i want to get your insight on this so uh, the the path that we are on in terms of mathematics in terms of uh, what is generally called artificial intelligence which a term that i don't particularly like is that it needs a lot of data and so you know you can you can uh, teach uh, a deep learning ne- neural network how to play go how to identify cats and dogs but you need you need millions and millions of uh, labeled data sets uh, for a machine to do that for the human doesn't require more than three data sets um, well yeah go ahead Yeah so so I would have absolutely agreed with you a year ago if we yeah. were doing this podcast but I have sort of started drinking the Kool-Aid um associated with the GPT-3 mm. that um has has recently come out and so GPT-3 is 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 a language model that was trained on the entire internet and used interestingly about 4 million dollars worth of electricity <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah. to to, to yeah. compute that language model and there are strong indications 
that that language model is um, starting to transcend that intense need for labeled data. So giving GPT-3 a few examples of the task that you would like it to do, it does a surprisingly good job. It, it, it um, you know, for instance, for, for writing articles, uh, it will write articles that are coherent for paragraphs and paragraphs. Um, task of play if they wanted to write a letter of recommendation to somebody. I, I actually used its precursor, GPT-2, <laughs> yeah. um, sort of an experiment with like, what do letters of recommendation written by GPT-2 look like? And I can tell you that they look great. Mm -hmm. um, and and GPT-3 was a huge step up on that. So, and in terms of, of things like, like poetry, things like music, um, it, it seems like it's close to cracking the magic there. And that may be because like my, my realm of appreciation for those things is limited, but I, I have a feeling that tasks like that are, are, are really going to be um, subsumed by these um, artificial intelligences. And that as, as the algorithms get better and as the learning models get larger, that this huge corpus of labeled data might not be as necessary as it seemed a few years ago. Now, I could be completely wrong. I could be just totally, totally wrong. It's, mm -hmm. it's not clear, but that would be if I had to guess, right? Yeah, so, yeah, I mean, th th that might be true, uh, but I still see sort of a, a prescriptive notion there. So, you know, if you take, uh, this, is where, this is where I believe, you know, artificial general intelligence is in interesting. That's probably the only artificial intelligence you can really, you know, really name. Uh, and, you know, can we take a, take a GPT-3 machine and, or, or some other AGI machine, and, you know, you can give it a task, uh, but do we see that machine sort of, you know, not doing the task and doing something else, <laughs> for instance, right? Uh, you know, the beauty of humans is that um, they're not really highly predictable. Um, you know, they, they may be predictable sort of the 50, 60 percent of what they do. The other 40 percent is very highly unpredictable. And so, so the real question for intelligence for me is, are we getting to machines that are, you know, sort of unpredictable, uh, but but creating things that you know we could not even have thought about? Yeah, I would I would argue that maybe yes. So yeah. in the experiments that 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 I've done, so so in the now I want to stress that I'm not actually writing my letters of recommendation using <laughs> this, this system that I've developed, um, and that's because I write letters of recommendation for graduates students where yeah. I know who I'm writing to, and it would take like GPT-4 probably to get those right. <laughs> right. Um, but with, with GPT-2, it was trained, the general model is trained on an enormous corpus of text. Mm -hmm. And then um, what, what I did was I, I, I fine-tuned it. So, so you're, if you, 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 you take the pre-trained model and then you fine-tune it on a corpus. So I took letters that I had I myself had, had written and then I, I fine tune on those letters. And so, and then, and then I give the, the system a prompt. So I say, so-and-so is applying to this and this and that position. And here's why they're a good person for that. Mm. And so then it, it, it draws, you know, from the corpus that, that I trained it on in my own work, but then because it knows about the entire internet, what happens sometimes is that, it literally will get a kind of off the wall idea mm. and write about that. So it will connect with something that it's iterating on that's used to what it's supposed to be doing. And then something in the model causes it to think something else. I'm using the word think in a very real <laughs> sense. And it'll come up with, with insights that are just astonishing. And, and so, for instance, there was, there was um, I, I also um, 
have been have been kind of disillusioned with the endless stream of habitable planet stories, like astronomers find this or that habitable planet right. orbiting this or that star, and it's always always the first time, and it had like a dozen first habitable planets. <laughs> yeah. Um, so what I did was was a student and I collected all of the articles that have been written in a number of venues ranging from sort of Fox News to New York Times. We collected all the articles about habitable planet discoveries over the last uh, 10 years mm. and fine trained GPT-2 on that and then gave GPT-2 just like a made up planetary system mm. and then looked at the articles that, that wrote and um, it would come up with these sort of statements that at first didn't seem to make sense, but then I, I realized that they were drawing on a larger fund of information that came from the pre-trained model. Mm -hmm. um, and so for instance, there was, there was one where it, it, it conflated stars as in like the star that the planet is orbiting, but then used sort of a double meaning, meaning star as in like a, uh, a famous person. Mm -hmm. And so it was planet, and, 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 and it's, I, I was like, whoa, this, this is the real deal. Mm. Um, this is genuine creativity and insight and the articles that it was writing in this sort of narrowly defined and almost stereotyped task of writing about the first habitable exoplanet, because that's been written about so many, there's been so many first exoplanets that, that you have this like kind of good template to work from. It was writing genuinely fresh new articles in what was really a tired genre. If I had to write an article about the discovery of some new exoplanet by some spacecraft that's supposedly how well, I would definitely use this to do it because it would do a better job. <laughs> so. Yeah, so so <clears throat> I, I have two thoughts. One is we have to test the hypothesis that a random combination of ideas um, might be considered very um, very useful or very intelligent by humans because we can interpret it, we can we can provide meaning to it, and and, and we can you know uh, create something out of it. That doesn't necessarily mean um, you know the machine is doing something uh, something interesting. So that that's my first thought. The the second thought I have is which is uh, more problematic, which is. Uh, suppose you say, you know, something like GPT-2 or GPT-3 is able to create, let's say, recommendation. Um, you're not doing this, but, I, you know, just, just a thought experiment, right? Um, it is able to create very good recommendations for your students. Uh, it might be that um, it is able to reduce humans to few templates, uh, so, I mean, humans, we, we have done this from inception, right? We have race, we have, you know, clans, we have all sorts of segmentation schemes that we use. And we, yeah. we take a member from that, that segmentation scheme and say that member has these characteristics and I can assign a bunch of other attributes to it. And we do that all the time. Maybe the machine is basically saying when I, when I you know, if I'm given a task of writing a recommendation, I can probably pick a template from six or seven, and then I can backfill that template, and it will come out to be something really, really interesting. In other words, I can reduce the complexity of creating that. I'm, I'm just, I'm just throwing this out as you know, <laughs> something to think yeah. about. Yeah. I know it is. It is something to think about. Um, you know, so the the usual, the usual kind of order is to say, well, the, the, the machine is putting together these random ideas and is giving the illusion of insight, but maybe that's all that we're doing too, <laughs> right? And I, yeah. I have experienced insight and it seems to come from, from random triggers, um, at least in my, my, my own experience. And it's possible, I mean, at some level, at some level, what's going on in the mind is probably not dependent on quantum mechanics 
in you know some sort of large macroscopic way. Consciousness is probably not some you know quantum phenomenon. It's probably a phenomenon that is governed by chemistry and by electrochemistry, basically. And if that's the case, then what's going on is 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 it's not deterministic, but it's mechanistic. Yeah. And that's not to degrade the quality of the human experience or anything like that. It's just just to say that that the that the brain may be a mechanistic, probably is a mechanistic um, system that, that that relies on chemistry and 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 um, electrochemistry to do what it does. And if that's true, there's then if the algorithms get better, there's no reason why machines can't use effectively the same algorithms that that we're using yeah exactly i think um yeah i mean i, mean, I think we have a lot of evidence on this greg uh you know that we are sort of mechanistic yeah. uh, i mean look, look at look at how people get information from social media uh how they internalize it how they actually use it um it, these these are these appear to be highly mechanistic uh, so given a set of initial conditions, you, you have high predictability how somebody would use a piece of information, very high predictability. Um, yeah. Yeah, no, and, and I think I, I, I agree with that completely, and I, I wouldn't leave that assignation to others. Like, I think I would be easy for gpt4 which is presumably being computed now using presumably of order 15 million dollars <laughs> i'm pretty sure that that if you use all the output that i've produced that's publicly available at gpt4 would easily provide an interview that's just as good as the one that i'm giving you. yeah that's that's quite possible and that's because i'm kind of predictable yeah and in, in fact gpt4 gpt5 uh one could argue that if if it if it takes all of what you have done, it can conceivably come up with a new idea and write a paper around that idea too, because at the end of the day, oh, right, a new idea is not necessarily new in the sense that uh, all we are doing is connecting together pieces yeah. of information that ultimately yeah. you know looks like it's new, right, <laughs> but yeah. but often not. Yeah, and that that that's that's really true. And then, you know, there's there certainly are are ideas, not ideas that I mean, the kind of stuff I'm talking about. There there are a lot of characters out there who can come up with that, right? It's this kind of combination of pop cosmology, like like trivial insights from artificial intelligence, all mashed together in like an up to the minute trope. And there are certainly <laughs> realms of thought that go just almost infinitely beyond that, right? So the guys who who came up with quantum mechanics in the 1920s or Einstein coming up with general relativity, those, that was true, genuine, remarkable insights into sort of the deep workings of how things are going. And I'm not doing that as much as I would like to do that. I'm, I'm not doing that. And so for some of those extraordinary insights, it might take, longer to get to that level but it's not clear that it's simply a matter of degree if somebody is a million times smarter than me um they might really really be um able to do extraordinary things and that's not that far away yeah yeah let me make a strong statement greg and you can correct me if, uh, if you like so uh, and and obviously i'm not a physicist but if you look at the major uh, major innovations in physics, uh, uh, theory of relativity, quantum mechanics, all of those things happened about 100 years ago. Yeah. And, you know, in about 100 years, uh, granted, string theory, which is more like an a untestable idea. Um, so, so one could argue that, and, and we had huge jumps in technology during this time. Computers have become extremely powerful, um, and more, more recently, we have now this thing called artificial intelligence that is taking over everything that human does. Um, in the process, we seem to have lost uh, the ability to, I don't know what the right term is, uh, but 
but conceptualize in the absence of data. And so, so, so most people, if they want to make a decision, has to sit down in front of a computer and, and grab a bunch of data. Um, and, and that has an inherent limitation, I think. And that limitation exists for computers. And we have made now humans uh, behave more like computers and less like humans in some ways. It's quite possible. I mean, the, I wouldn't like, if you, if you just look at the limited example of general relativity and quantum mechanics, qu quantum mechanics was built on trying to understand strange data you yeah. know, the, the, the behavior of, of, for instance, electrons and in double slit experiment, things like that. Yeah. The quantum mechanics was created to, to wrestle with the just completely non-classical behavior that, 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 subatomic particles exhibit. Yeah. So I would argue that, that in that case, that, that it was data-based. General relativity is different. General relativity, I think it's really the only physical theory that emerged effectively fully formed as a kind of critique in the Kantian sense of pure reason. Yeah. And it's sort of unique in that way and probably will continue to be unique. The various string theories um, there's no way to know whether they're correct. They're only, you know, they're maybe logically consistent. But what was interesting is the general relativity, in addition to being logically consistent, turned out to be the way that the universe runs its gravitational operations. Yeah, yeah. Um, and it's just a remarkable, remarkable thing that it turned out that way. Um, so I don't know. It's, it's, it'll, it'll, I think what is interesting, it'll be interesting to see what happens. Um, it's, it's things are moving very quickly. The next five years aren't going to be like the last five years and, you know, hoping for the best. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So that's what I want to ask you in conclusion. So if you look forward, say 2040, you mentioned 2040 as a, as a, as a possible date for some sort of singularity in the AI context. Um, so, so what would you sort of speculate, um, we have a lot of experiments going on on the technology side. Um, generally speaking, I would argue that conceptual leaps are missing. Um, we can get more processors, we can get more memory, we can get quantum computing going. Um, all of those could happen by then. So, so what would you speculate by 2040? Where, where do you think we will be? Well, you know what I'm gonna do? here is sort of point to this project that I've been involved in for the last five years. It's, it's called um, Metaculus, yeah. M-E-T-A-C-U-L-U-S. And what Metaculus is, is it's a prediction website. Mm -hmm. And so if you, if you go to Metaculus, you can make predictions on now thousands of different questions. Now, if you go there right now, it's just Trump, 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 Trump election, 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 um, just because that's, that's what people are interested in in the moment, right? And so we've had tens of thousands of visitors who are coming be, be, because of that. But, but if you drill down or if you go to the topics, um, something that we've been running is a series of questions about uh, artificial intelligence outcomes. Mm -hmm. And these questions run the gamut from near-term outcomes, like for instance, how many parameters will GPT-4 have when it's released and when will it be released? As those are questions that are gonna resolve you know, on a time scale of months to a mm. year or so, to longer scale questions like when will the um, first ad advanced general intelligence emerge you know but lots of questions about artificial intelligence and, and that's in the sense why we formed the site because we were interested in getting at the best consensus judgment yeah. sort of taken over a large number of diverse individuals as to what we what you know the kind of community as a whole thinks will happen and it's known that these predictions aggregation um, techniques are the best way to get an idea of what will happen. It's not infallible, but it's, you know, the, the, the ideas, the predictions that are on Metaculus, I would warrant are probably our best current view of things like when an advanced general intelligence is going to emerge. Yeah. 
Um, so rather than speculate, <laughs> I would like just to point your listeners to the site and urge them if they're not interested in some politics, <laughs> which are at the top of the site right now, which I certainly can 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 understand given the fatigue with all that. There's a really, really interesting um, set of questions that are a little bit lower down the, 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 the traffic list that delve into exactly the kinds of issues that we've been talking about. In this podcast. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I will definitely try it. Um, and so, uh, so Greg, we, we couldn't get to your finance papers. Perhaps we can do another, another podcast specifically in that area. Um, sure. But yeah, that's stuff. Yeah, yeah. Clear. This has been great, Greg. Thanks so much for spending time with me. And uh, good luck with. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. This is a Scientific Sense podcast providing unscripted conversations with leading academics and researchers on a variety of topics. If you'd like to sponsor this podcast, please reach out to info at scientificsense.com.